Earlier this week, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky once again pressed U.S. lawmakers to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine, which is intended to limit Russia's ability to continue their invasion of his nation. This is far from the first time a no-fly zone has been proposed, but despite the tragic circumstances the Ukrainian people now find themselves in, NATO leaders have thus far been nearly unanimous in dismissing the idea as untenable. Let's talk about why a no-fly zone over Ukraine won't work. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. In order to realistically determine if a no-fly zone over Ukraine is a good idea, you have to be able to look at the situation through an objective lens. And that's no easy feat while innocent people are being killed by Russian air and missile strikes every day. Establishing a no-fly zone alone, however, does nothing. It can only change matters over Ukraine if enforced. And that very likely means combat. This isn't just a challenge for those of us working to develop our own positions on the topic in a complex media environment like the one we're in. It's also a big challenge for policymakers and diplomats tasked with simultaneously maintaining global stability while also supporting Ukraine during the largest conflict on European soil since the end of World War II. Fortunately, the arithmetic isn't complicated. Assessing the value of a no-fly zone really comes down to a simple risk versus reward proposition. We have to weigh the risks of sending NATO aircraft into Ukrainian airspace to engage Russian aircraft against the potential benefits doing so could provide the Ukrainian people. If after the math is complete, the risk side of the equation is bigger than the reward side, the concept just isn't a good one. But before we go on, it's important that we not fall victim to the either-or fallacy, sometimes referred to as the false dilemma. The options here are not to establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine or nothing, but they're rather to establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine or a whole slew of other options, some of which may be more effective. And the first thing we've got to discuss, of course, is the nuclear elephant in the room. Arguing against a no-fly zone in Ukraine may seem downright insensitive or even self-serving, and to some extent it really might be. But self-serving pragmatism has, for the past 73 years, been the very basis of modern global stability. The advent of nuclear weapons, and more importantly the Soviet Union's development of comparable atomic bombs in 1949, forced a dramatic shift in the way global powers engage in direct competition, and for good reason. Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD, is predicated on the willingness of nuclear powers to leverage their weapons to lay waste to their opponents, as well as their opponents' willingness to respond in kind. And in many ways, this looming threat of total annihilation has been one of, if not the, most effective means of deterring global war in the modern era, ranked just above an increasingly intertwined global economy and probably well ahead of still valuable global peacekeeping initiatives like the United Nations. Ukraine is a big geographical region. It's a little bit smaller than the state of Texas. Policing airspace that large would require a huge number of aircraft and countless opportunities for individual engagements, if Russia chose to press into Ukrainian airspace anyway. At that point, we're now talking about American fighters squaring off against Russian pilots in combat. While this isn't unheard of, every exchange would bring our nations significantly closer to open war and potentially even a nuclear one. But here in the U.S., with our modern concept of war largely based on the global war on terror, nuclear annihilation just isn't a pressing anxiety anymore. And because of that, many of us have come to dismiss Putin's nuclear threats as nothing more than theater. After all, the embattled Russian president knows that launching a nuclear attack on the West would undoubtedly result in Russia's ruin. But the argument that America should call Putin's nuclear bluff is based entirely on the good intentions of a ruthless dictator who feels increasingly backed into a corner economically, militarily, and diplomatically. While it does seem unlikely that Putin would resort to nuclear strikes, Pressing him to do so would literally mean betting our children's survival on Putin's calm, rational decision-making prowess. 
Now, this isn't to say that nuclear war would be an inevitable outcome of establishing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Rather, it's highlighting the biggest risk right off the bat. Now, I realize that the potential nuclear annihilation of human civilization sounds an awful lot like hyperbole, but this is one case where our sensationalized idea of what nuclear war is, despite pop culture fiction, is accurate enough to give us a real sense of the stakes here. Now, with nukes out of the way, let's talk about previous no-fly zones and how they didn't really work as well as you might think. As outlined in an excellent piece by Richard K. Betts for Foreign Affairs, our modern concept of no-fly zones are based really entirely on sets of circumstances that were nothing like those currently faced over Ukraine. Betts points out that previous no-fly zones were enacted against nations with very limited air power capabilities who could do next to nothing to stand up to NATO's massive air power apparatus. But despite that, in every instance of a no-fly zone being enforced, things went kinetic. In other words, people started shooting at each other. In another great piece from retired Navy aviator and associate professor of law at Syracuse University, Mark Nevitt, published by Just Security, he outlines the circumstances and outcomes of previous efforts to establish and enforce no-fly zones dating all the way back to 1991. Despite having overwhelming air superiority, NATO aircraft still faced engagement from surface-to-air missiles and even other aircraft. Not to mention the fact that the complexity of operating massive no-fly zone operations increases other risks, like the potential for friendly fire incidents. I won't delve into each of them, but here's a brief summary. In the no-fly zones enforced over Iraq in Operation Southern Watch and Northern Watch between 1991 and 2003, force was employed repeatedly to maintain the integrity of the no-fly zone, and at least two U.S. Army Blackhawks were shot down by friendly fire after being misidentified. In the no-fly zones enforced over Bosnia in 1992 and 1995, U.S. Air Force F-16s were forced to shoot down at least four Serbian fixed-wing tactical aircraft that were trying to engage ground forces. And while NATO aircraft were not directly engaged during the no-fly zone enforced over Libya, it's important to remember that these aircraft were actively bombing Libyan targets on the ground. That's a degree of involvement significantly higher than simply enforcing a no-fly zone. Now, unlike the limited air power and air defense capabilities offered by these nations, Russia has the second largest air force in the world, though it's important to note they are a far second, and they also boast very advanced air defense systems. Trying to enforce a no-fly zone over an area the size of Ukraine against such a large force is something that's literally never been done, and if contested, could result in a very rapid escalation of this conflict. But let's address those who think a no-fly zone could be enforced without ever firing a shot, because unfortunately that does not seem to be the case. Even those taking a pragmatic view of trying to establish and enforce a no-fly zone over Ukraine tend to limit their imagined operation to just NATO fighters patrolling the airspace to deter or even shoot down Russian sorties. Now that's part of it, but there's a lot more to controlling the airspace of a nation the size of Ukraine than simply pouring fighters into the sky. Russian air defense systems are widely believed to be among the best in the world, despite their limited success in controlling Ukraine's airspace to date. Russia's S-400 Triumph, for example, is often touted as potentially capable of identifying and targeting stealth aircraft, though just how successful it would be against really tough-to-target platforms like the F-35 remains the subject of lots of debate online, and I'll leave that one to you guys in the comments. But even if NATO were to limit its use of fighters within Ukraine to just stealth platforms, which really wouldn't be feasible considering the amount of territory to cover and the number of airframes available, NATO's air presence could not be limited to fighters. Air operations over Ukraine would need massive amounts of fuel flowing into and out of Ukrainian airspace via big, heavy tankers like the KC-135. Now, these would be easy targets for systems like the S-400. And they're not the only ones. Other essential support aircraft, like E-3 Sentry Airborne Warning and Control Systems, or AWACS, would likely be easy prey for advanced Russian air defenses as well. So, in order to mitigate the threat posed to these aircraft, as well as fourth-generation fighters, Russian ground-based air defenses, both inside Ukraine and beyond, would have to be eliminated at the onset of establishing a no-fly zone. Now, I want to be very clear about what this means. 
It means that in order to safely establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine, it will require airstrikes against Russian troops and equipment inside Ukraine, Russia, and potentially even Belarus if they permitted Russian equipment to operate from their soil, which is feasible if not likely. That S-400 Triumph system I mentioned earlier has an operational range of right around 250 miles, which means Russian systems could engage NATO aircraft from well within Russian territory. These systems would have to be engaged directly, likely using anti-radiation missiles like the AGM-88 Harm, which can't currently be deployed from stealthy jets like the F-35, and would instead have to be carried into Russia aboard modified F-16s or F-A-18 Super Hornets. Now, there are other methods of targeting air defense systems that don't rely on radar hunting missiles. We could feasibly deploy special operations troops into Russia to identify and target systems for subsequent airstrikes. But again, that means sending Delta or Green Berets into Russia, and that's a significant escalation towards open war. As we've seen in previous situations where no-fly zones were enacted, low-flying NATO aircraft over Ukraine would still face being targeted by systems like Russia's man-portable 9K-38 IGLA, which is a surface-to-air missile. That means NATO pilots would also be faced with having to decide whether or not to engage Russian ground forces often. And needless to say, that again dramatically increases the possibility of open war between NATO or the US and Russia. But let's say, hypothetically, that Russia and Vladimir Putin acted out of character and backed down to a NATO no-fly zone and immediately removed all of their air defense systems from the area. Unfortunately, that wouldn't do much to turn the tides of this conflict, and it wouldn't even stop Russian airstrikes from making landfall in Ukraine. A no-fly zone, if enacted and enforced, would prevent Russian aircraft from operating freely over Ukraine. But that wouldn't mean an end to attacks from the air or a significant enough reduction in Russia's military capabilities to give Ukraine any kind of real advantage. Thus far in this conflict, Russian air power has failed to dominate the Ukrainian airspace, and many experts contend airstrikes have consistently been less effective than Russian artillery, rocket barrages, and mortar fire. A no-fly zone would do absolutely nothing to limit the use or effectiveness of these weapons. And it's important to remember that even with a sky full of NATO aircraft, Russia would still have some 180,000 troops operating within Ukraine's borders. Now, we also have to consider that Russia's inability to dominate Ukrainian airspace has allowed Ukraine's forces to leverage drones for reconnaissance and airstrikes. When enforcing a no-fly zone over Ukraine, NATO would have to decide whether or not it would permit Ukraine to continue to operate these and other aircraft freely. If they did, this would look a lot less like enforcing a no-fly zone and a lot more like simply joining this conflict on Ukraine's behalf and declaring war on Russia. But the limited benefits of a well-enforced no-fly zone took yet another blow this past weekend, as Russian heavy payload strategic bombers began launching cruise missiles at targets inside Ukraine from deep within Russian airspace. Weapons like Russia's air-launched KH-555 cruise missile have ranges in excess of 2,000 miles. So for NATO to prevent these attacks, they would have to either send fighters deep into Russian territory to shoot these bombers down, or deploy crude air defense systems inside Ukraine that are capable of intercepting cruise missiles. So our options, again, are either sending fighters into Russia to fight Russian jets, or putting U.S. troops on the ground inside Ukraine. Again, both big steps toward open war. And while Russia's supply of these particularly long-range weapons are indeed limited, Russia's got plenty of weapons with sufficient reach to be fired from inside Russian airspace and still engage Ukrainian targets, especially if they're not particular about where they hit. In fact, according to the Pentagon, Russian aircraft are currently flying around 200 sorties a day to launch munitions at Ukraine, but most of them never actually leave Russian airspace. When you look at all of this objectively, it starts to look a lot like a no-fly zone over Ukraine would have limited benefit for Ukraine and potentially disastrous results for the world at large. Now, I am well aware of the arguments that say that the United States and NATO are already actively involved in this conflict. After all, we're sending a great deal of hardware and equipment and money to Ukraine's defense. But to be honest, I find these arguments a bit disingenuous. 
There is a really big difference between providing defensive and military equipment and actually flying into Ukrainian airspace in U.S. flagged aircraft to shoot down Russian jets. And there's an even bigger difference between providing support and actually engaging in airstrikes inside Russian territory, or Belarus for that matter. It's pretty difficult to argue in good faith that sending equipment is the same thing as conducting airstrikes inside Russia. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not trying to just pile on those arguing for a no-fly zone. I genuinely get it. But even if you sincerely believe that a no-fly zone over Ukraine could be the first one in history to ever be enacted and enforced without ever firing a shot, you have to understand that at that point you're placing a great deal of faith in Vladimir Putin. We're talking about Russian forces voluntarily ceding the skies to NATO, and Russian air defense systems in Ukraine, Russia, and potentially even Belarus powering down and not engaging any of these aircraft, including Ukrainian aircraft, if we allow them to fly. What that really means is we're talking about Vladimir Putin publicly backing down to the West. We'd then be asking the Russian president to prioritize preventing a broader conflict over his objectives within Ukraine, over the justifications he's provided for this invasion, and over his own perceptions among the Russian people and the Russian oligarchy. When Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was seen seemingly backing down to the West after the Cuban Missile Crisis, as most of the world was unaware that America had made concessions as well, his authority within the Soviet Union was immediately in question. Now, Putin has built the modern Russian government around himself, almost as though he's the cornerstone, making it very difficult for him to be removed from power. But he's certainly aware that a great deal of his authority and credibility as a leader is all based on this perception of him as an expert strategist and perhaps the only leader strong enough to win a staring contest with the West. Enforcing a no-fly zone over Ukraine would be betting big that Russian President Vladimir Putin values our collective well-being over his own. And I'm just not sure that's a very good bet. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below, and don't forget to leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, make sure you tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.